So hi everybody, I'm Dr Jay from uh, ThoughtWorks working for the Department for Transport and hopefully I am now sharing the right screen and you can all see the technical working group for downloaders yes. up on your screens. Fantastic. Um, Adrian's not here today, I've got my colleague Lucy who's going to be taking notes and uh, um, helping out. So let's go through and um, we're, I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're doing with NAPTAN, just a refresher, um, talk about how we're conceiving it, and then I'm going to be running some an icebreaker, and then I'm going to be running some exercises to get about some specific points, and then there's a nice big free-for-all spot called data quality, how can we make it better, and another one called just one thing, which is just one thing that we could fix for you. So hopefully it'll take about two hours. I think last time we went about five minutes over, but we're going to try to stick as much as we can to time, so hopefully everyone's up for this wonderful fun ride. Um, so just a quick thing of why we're looking at NAPTAN and I was trying to explain it to people and I started to use a little bit of a story of like um, the quick story is the bus a council worker moves a bus stop because there's some roadworks around the corner I can't draw corners very well so I had just had to draw a line and wrote the word corner there um, and there is a blind passenger who is sitting at the bus stop waiting for the bus which will never arrive until somebody says to them ah mate the bus stop's closed so using this kind of narrative, then wanted to look at how NAPTAN fits into this and how it kind of fits together. Uh, by the way, I'm a service designer, so that's why you get lots of drawings and this kind of wider, wider look of everything. So again, the council worker moves the bus stop, he drops an email off to uh, local transport authority data administrator, they move the bus stop, in whatever system they've got. It gets uploaded to NAPTAN, which is solid gold data, high quality, brilliant, you know, all the sort of things that we want with data. And the bus operator gets updated, possibly via an API, possibly via something else, and they reschedule any impacts due to the roadworks. Um, a software company downloads those changes, they update their software, and the blind user is told, hey, the bus stop's moved, you're planning on doing this journey, the bus stops moved around the corner for the next six weeks, so they go to the right place to catch their bus. That's kind of the vision and how I'm thinking about NAPTAN and the narrative that I'm using to play around it. Um, so we're in the midst of an alpha phase, which is about doing some technical exploration and some user exploration, which a lot of this is, and then we're going to be moving into a private beta phase. Um, this is part of the government digital services style of planning through any changes. Um, so if there'll be a chance at the end to get in touch and say, yes, I'd I'd love to be part of the private beta or please don't talk to me at all about this private beta thing. Um, but first off, I wanted to go through and do a bit of an icebreaker because it's good to know who's who's on the call and understand a little bit about everybody. Then we'll talk about what is a bus stop. This may sound really obvious, but it's actually really important differences to be aware of. Then talk a little bit about accessibility, downloading files, some data validation, data correction to really get an understanding of what you're having to do to the data to make it usable and what we can do further upstream to make more usable data available to you to kind of so, so it's much better if we do it once than to have everybody doing it 50 different times. And then we wanna look at one thing we could fix. So for the icebreaker, um, I'd like everyone to do their name, e.g. I'm Dr. J, their pronoun, my pronoun is they. What company you work for? I work for ThoughtWorks and we're working with Department for Transport. And what's the best place on the bus upstairs or downstairs? Mine's downstairs by the deck, by the back door because there's a little, on TFL buses, there's usually a nice little seat that's got a tiny bit more leg room and is quite easy to get on and off the bus from. So that's my entire, that's my icebreaker. So I'm going to go through and I'll just call out people. I'm going to use the alphabetical alphabetical um, list of, of people and the participants and just call each person as, as I get to your name. Fantastic. So thank you everybody for coming along today. Um, and I know some of you went through this last week, so hopefully it's with a slightly different lens this time. So if I can click on the right page. 
So what is a bus stop? Now, I know this was a contentious question. If you listen to the recording, what we're trying to understand is, do I see a bus stop the same way as you see a bus stop? And with this, I've changed it around ever so slightly because there's two notions of a bus stop that we need to consider. One is a physical bus stop, the, the, the physical thing that's sitting on the road, and one is a logical bus stop that sits within the software that sits within the schedules and things like that. And sometimes they're exactly the same thing in our minds, and sometimes they need to be separated out. So for those who've done this before, you'll probably find Murali and go, ah, I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, so we're going to go on to Murali. If you follow the link, and we can't share it out because we can't chat on Teams because that would be way too much like useful. So we've got a um, bit.ly DFT bus upload and there'll be a password when you get to that and it, the, it's all capitalized. So you've got to do NAPTAN hyphen download exactly as written there. And then you should be able to join me on the mural, uh, which will be here. And I should be able to see you all come in and join me. And I'm so hoping this works today. Now, if anyone's having problems, we'll take a few minutes and get everybody here. Can you show Can you that? Go back to the password. Oh, oh, oh yes, sorry. Yeah. I'll stick back on this one and then swap across. What did you decide to do? Oh, yes, I can see a couple of people joining. Can you go back to where that thing was, please? Oh, sorry. I'm I sorry, was... I'm a bit slow. Oh, no, no, no. I was just checking that people, that some people had joined. So I'm more than happy to stay here. Um, just call out if you're, if you're having trouble. I'm happy to sit here and sip coffee. Mark, I wish I could. In the future, I will, I will get Tim to make this part of the invite or something like that, so that people can see it, people can join this, and um, actually have the links rather than having to type in from a screen because I know it's the hardest thing to do. I'm just going to check and see. I have a few more people there. That's fantastic. So we're going to stay at, at just this area of what is a bus stop for the moment. Tim, did you manage to get there? Oh, sorry, Mark Taylor. Wrong. wrong it's um, not my first attempt. Naptan download, isn't it? Yeah, Naptan hyphen yeah. short small small hyphen download with a capital d yeah um so log in nope try again oh perhaps you ought to move on i don't want to stop everybody else i'll put my i'll put my email address in and then n-a-p-t-a-n dash it's a dash not an underscore is it it's, it's a dash not with a capital underscore. D. yeah but no, the download no with a capital d yeah and naptan spelt the way that it is yeah yeah okay say yeah. Nope. Try again. Go on. You oh. continue on. Okay. I don't want to hold this up. I'll Very keep bashing of... away. See. Tim, uh, hopefully, if if you could help me out and just email that through, email the details through to Mark. That would be amazing. I just have. Yeah. Oh, Tim, have. you are you are the best. You are simply the best. So if I just zoom in ever so slightly here, um, what I'd like you to do, there are some. Uh, if you click on the text, which is the first, the second icon down that's got a little corner on it, you can get some sticky notes. I'd like you to grab a sticky note and put whether you agree or disagree with the way that I've thought about bus stops here. So I see bus stops in terms of downloaders. 
that the LA data admin puts in the information. And this thing's about a physical bus stop and a logical bus stop. And it's the bus operators who are using the details of the logical bus stop. And it's the software developers who are using the information about a physical bus stop. And they're using it, the software devs for the physical bus stop are using it for location and accessibility information. And the bus operators are using the logical bus stop information for route planning. So travel time, transfer time, and mapping out routes. Have I got that concept right? Do you agree or disagree with what I'm doing there? And I'm going to set a little timer uh, for five minutes and just give you time to get comfortable dragging, dropping, and writing on sticky notes and um, saying whether or not you agree or disagree and any changes that you'd like to see on there. Is that good for everybody? So what I might also do is I will add a sticky note on either side um, so people can copy those, paste them, drag and drop them so you don't need to uh, try and find them in, the, uh, in that second icon down on the left if you need them. So we've got about three minutes left. I'm hoping that Mark has managed to find his way in. No, Mark hasn't, but don't worry. I'm wondering if Mark has the bitly right. No, I got through to bit. I got through to the page. Okay, it was the putting in my email address, Mark Taylor at Staffordshire.gov.uk, and then put in the password, and it didn't like it. Oh, it said nope. Try again. So I don't know. Oh, that's not that's not incredibly useful of it. Just no. Nope, maybe it's my again. fingers. Mark, Mark, I don't think yeah. you need to put your email address in. You just put. Why is it name asking in? me to put it in then? Oh right, okay. I didn't. I, put I, I, I don't address. look, Tim. It's not. It's not important. <laughs> I can say what I want to say, probably. <laughs> I have a <clears throat> I have a different issue. I mind saying trying to reconnect and it doesn't let me in. Oh. I can see some people are in, so it, it must be my my side. But yeah, I got through to the password and then tried to refresh and then still didn't let me in. Oh. Oh, so um if you're if you're having trouble pr problems, um if you want to tell it to me, I can quickly type it in. That's completely fine for both of the marks. I love that it is actually <laughs> it is having a problem with Mark is obviously what this what is what is the issue with mural today? Definitely. <laughs> so Mark and Mark, do you have any thoughts about this? And I can quickly type them in. I've been thinking about getting getting logged in, not thinking about the bus stops. That's my brain activity has been involved. Uh, let's, let's see what other people have put.
OK, so we've got about 20 seconds left. And then I'll start to go through and what I'll do is I'll ask that we do the same as last time. If you just use the raise hand um, to talk and then I'll call on you and that way we can kind of keep, although it's not 60 people, but we can keep things flowing a little bit. If that works. So if everyone's put their stuff on, let me just zoom in slightly so I can find it all. So in, I don't have anyone agreeing with me today of the way that I've drawn this out. Um, I just wanted to check, is that because the agreeing people are just like, yeah, it seems, it seems okay. Or um, is it that this is so wrong that this isn't agreeing with anybody? If somebody wants to put their hand up and just let me know how they feel about that. Wow, have I got it that wrong that nobody is going to agree with me, even when I ask people, do, do you agree with me? OK, so that's good to know. Um, so on the disagree side, we've got um, name codes and identifiers are important. The type of stop and the mode used. So I'm taking it, this is whether it's a hail and ride or a flex, uh, a coach stop. Is that what somebody's meaning by this one? Uh, and I just need to find the hand up. Just be with me here a moment. Uh, Dan. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the type of stop is, yeah, is it a bus stop? Yeah, is it a hail and ride? That's important uh, for us uh, on the kind of software development side of things. Yeah. And the names and codes is also, I wrote, was also important on the software devs. And also a lot of things that uh, hit on the bus operators is also important for the software dev side of things. Is using okay. It. <laughs> So uh, it's all kind of, I'm, I'm not even going to call it meta detail. It's all of that kind of um, minutiae. So it's um, har, et cetera, um, there, and those two sit together. So then we've got geocoding, accessibility info, et cetera, will surely be included in logical stop data. The logical stop should be a reflection of the physical one in an ideal world. So even though I've separated it out, there are actually things where so much of it fits together, there is really for for you a single bus stop that has both the physical information and the logical or non-physical information. Would that be a better thing? And Dan, uh, it, I'm not sure if you've got your hand up again or it's a, it's a legacy hand. It was a legacy hand, sorry. Uh, Mark. Mark Taylor. T. Um, for me, the bus stop is principally NAPTAN data, but it's also other assets that go that are present at the bus stop, like the, whether it's got a raised platform, whether there's a shelter. It's nothing to do with NAPTAN, but in terms of recording data, I could record it in one place. And that's important to do the activity once. I mentioned this last week. Yeah. And it's about the what's there physically. It, the, 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 the logical bit of it is pretty much a description of what the actual bus stop is there on the ground. If there is actually a physical bus stop on the ground, as we said last week, some are unmarked. Mm -hmm. Considerable number in rural areas. And that would be noted as part of the NAPTAN data as being unmarked and there would be no assets associated with it. There'll be no shelter or anything. Mm. Non-NAPTAN data. Yeah. Non-NAPTAN. But in terms of data, data, what's the word? Data management, just having, having the assets associated with a basic NAPTAN record is in my view, a good thing. So you don't enter data twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then just the last one that I'm going to touch on here before we move on is could a logical bus stop be called a non-physical bus stop? Um, I'm calling it a logical bus stop and that came from a conversation with Nick Knowles talking about the data oh, structure yeah. within the system. But I'm wondering if the, the word logical is potentially setting us in the wrong place. 
and we do need to talk about it as metadata or non-physical assets. Does that make, would that fit with people a little bit better? I don't understand what you mean. So if I call um, the use of the word logical bus stop came from a conversation with Nick Knowles, who was explaining how the schema was set up and created and how the data was put together. Um, and one of the things there is that um, the people who created the NAPTAN schema used the word logical, but is that something that doesn't resonate with this group? Because that would be a thing where I would potentially look to tweak and adjust how we talk about it. It doesn't resonate with me. Thanks, Mark. But um, maybe I'm different from everybody. <laughs> Andrew. Morning again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I put that uh, post-it note there because um, something that's logical to one person may not be logical to everyone. So I just think if you just say it's not there as it's non-physical, at least we all get the message. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, and I, I, I'm almost tempted to use the word metadata, but metadata has an entirely separate meaning as well. So it's about the non-physical attributes of a bus stop, which feed into some of the route planning and that. Uh, Tim. Okay. Uh, it used to be called a virtual bus stop, which maybe people understand a bit more than logical. Yeah. I virtual. Think that's virtual. Yeah. Ah, that's good to understand. Yeah. So what's the virtual one then? That's a that's non-physical one, is it? Is it yeah, a that's a not physical one? one. So, so that's a uh, custom and practice, or the stop that's opposite the physical one on a bi-directional stop. I, I like non-physical or custom and practice as a term. Oh, that's what I'm virtual. familiar with. But oh, there you go. So, so I actually think we're talking about two slightly different things here. Andrew, I'll just let you go first and then I'll... No, it's, it's, it's okay. I'll, um, hold on. Uh, I'll listen, but carry on. Ah, because, because my thing was um, every bus is a physical and a logical bus stop. So while it's custom and practice to stand on the patch of grass that's at the end of this gate and wave your arm and, and eventually the bus will appear or wave your arm when the bus appears and the bus will stop at that patch of grass. Um, which is a custom and practice stop. That's still a physical stop. A logical stop is knowing that when you're planning your route, that your bus driver and your and your route needs to go past that stop and needs to go past that place and needs to um, have a, tra a travel time to and from that place and a loading time at that place. Um, and so those kind of more plenty logical attributes are what I was considering to be a logical bus stop and a physical bus stop was anywhere what was the one the other week uh, a bus stop is is anywhere a bus stops um, which I very much liked and 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 that's about the the bus stopping and a physical spot is slightly different to how you map out the routes Beth have I confounded the situation Maybe, maybe not. We have um, what we call dummy stops, which are we use for timing points in hail and ride areas. Um, hail and ride for us in certain areas are, say, housing estates that we can't physically put bus stops in, um, but we'll stop anywhere where it's safe to do so on a, st a stretch of road. So there might not be a patch of grass, um, but because there might be a car park there and then the bus will stop, say, 400 yards down the street because that's safer than that patch of grass. Mm hmm um, but we have dummy stops in as well if we need to put timing points in. So mm -hmm. is that what you're trying to get at? We have a, yeah. a thing and it has a foot of, well, we're, we're 450 in West Yorkshire. We have 450 numbers. Every dummy stop, timing point, uh, sorry, dummy stop, hail and ride stop, physical stop are all given 450 codes and are all exported as part of our nap time. Is that what you're getting at? Uh, yeah, I think that's the concept that I, I'm trying to think about it conceptually of what's the difference between understanding uh, something that's physical and something that, happens within the software that, that that happens logically and what are the different needs for those but I get a sense that I've I've gone a little bit deep but I like that explanation Lee you're up yeah similar to um, 
what the colleague from York, Yorkshire was just saying then, uh, we're looking to introduce DRT in a very um, rural airport uh, area surrounding the east of Bristol Airport, and we would be putting in sort of virtual or you know non-physical stops um, additionally to support that network when it comes online. What is a DRT, if you could uh, help me out there? Yeah, demand responsive, so Uber by bus. Uber by bus. Yeah. Ah, right. City Mapper. Uh, sorry, I um, yeah. lived in London for 15 years, arriving from New Zealand, which didn't have a lot of buses um, where I grew up. So just trying to understand. So they're kind of those ones. Um, City Mapper had them. Where of you had to book them a bit like an Uber, but they went specific routes. No, no. Ours is um, fully flexible within the area, so um, it is part of the. Um, the new sort of expansion into rural mobility but um yeah we're, we're exploring options for that so it would be um pretty much you ring anywhere within the area and then you're shipped to a more physical uh, bus stop for interchange ah right so it's kind of collecting people and taking yeah. them to like a bus interchange yeah. where they can catch one. other buses yeah gotcha that's a brilliant idea actually if it works uh, hopefully hopefully people like it and at the and moment like the they're, they're just money pits but we're, we're trying something new because we're running conventional bus services down country lanes that aren't carrying anyone in a huge subsidy per head yeah that makes a lot of sense um is there anything else on bus stops before we move along Brilliant. And just wanted to thank you all for your thoughts on this because it's been so useful. So moving on, we've got the, the bus stops. Um, the next one is accessibility. So I know some of you are going to have a lot of thoughts on this and we got a lot of thoughts last time. So what I want to understand is from a downloader's perspective, so from a perspective of people who are taking the data from NAPTAN, doing something with it and putting it out there, what accessibility information do you have? If you could, would you use it? How would you use it? And what would change for you? So we know from the uploader's point of view, there was a wonderful discussion around what would what would need to happen and some really good ideas came out. Now we want to look at from a downloader's point of view. So if there is accessibility data, would you use it? How would you use it? And what would change for you if you if you used it? Um, but also, do you want accessibility data? Is that something important to you currently? So if we move to the next area, and hopefully this will just take me straight across. I'm loving this because it makes such a difference to my life. Um, I've got some spaces there. So on the left hand side is if I could, I would. So put your stickies there to talk about if you could get access accessibility data, how would you use it? Uh, if you could, you would use accessibility data. Below, how would you use that data? And over on the left hand side, right hand side, what would change for you if this data was provided? So I'm going to give you like five minutes again to give us some fast feedback on this. Um, and hopefully you can all figure out using the sticky notes and Mark and Mark, um, if you want to call out your ideas or your thoughts here, that's totally okay. I'll type them in for you. I just discovered I can send a quick message on 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 here. I am going to just try something. Excuse me here for a moment while I attempt to do something funky with Teams. For Mark and Mark. Sorry, just to add to that, Ian at LCC, I can't get anything going on that either because okay. it throws you out uh, on refreshing. Oh, that is so annoying. I'm just trying to send a quick message. I'm up. I don't know what's just happened. Sharing is paused until I return. Okay, uh, sorry. So that was Ian, 
in Barrett, wasn't it? Uh, if I do, just bear with me. I I I had sent a quick message. There we are. If I just do that, and Mark Jones is the other person. I have just discovered how to do a a quiet chat between people, even though Teams says that it doesn't do it. Where does the message appear? I really have no idea. If somebody wants to send, try sending me a quick message. If you moused over me inside my picture, I think you and then right click or left click, hover, and then it comes up with a whole pile of things about me. And one of them is a little chat button that says send a quick message. No idea where it appears. Not on mine, it doesn't. Mm, okay. It's got, it's, uh, it's popped up it's on got mine. Mute participant pin spotlight fit to frame. Ah, uh, if you if you just hover rather than click, it'll come up with a little cardy thing, a little white box, and one of them is send quick message. Mark, did my quick message get through to you? The other Mark, it sorry. Yes, it did. Um, so it's come through into the in Teams. There's the chat option on the left. When you click on chat, your um, message appeared, and I've just replied to it. Um, okay. Not sure if let that's come back to you. Oh, good grief! <laughs> let me see. Let me see if I can find that. On the left, there's a chat option. In Teams. I think if I just click on this. <laughs> no, no, that 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 was way too much. Like, start a group chat. No, no, that no. I've gone way too funky. I can't see. I can't see the replies. Ah, <sighs> Teams. Yeah, I've Ian again. Yeah, I've received a message and chat, gone into it again, but we're still just getting total uh, refresh, uh, trying to reconnect all the time, so we won't actually do anything. Oh, that is annoying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ian. If you, if you and the two marks want to tell me any of your thoughts, I'm totally happy to put stickies up for you and and put them in. If we had the accessibility information about a stop, we would provide it. Mm -hmm. The system, the system we have doesn't export it into any NAPTAN, so even though we might have it, we can't get it out in any format. Um, Plus, we would have to do a survey of what is at stops, because obviously they change quite frequently. So um, can you just let me know, just be with me here two seconds, what is the, just trying to grab a sticky note again, what is the uh, system that you're using so that it doesn't provide it? Uh, it's OmniFlight. It's an omnibus system. Omnibus system. Yeah. Okay, cool. That just it, it outputs it into the format that's requested through the NAPTANS uh, standards. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to change the standards, it'd be like everything else that's gone on recently. They'll have to change the standard, and then they'll have to change the software in order mm -hmm. to update it and export it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's partly why I'm I'm being I'm I'm trying to understand as much as possible. Um, Ian, I'm I'm going to put you on my list of people that I, I want to do a follow up call with, if that's going to be OK with you. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. Fantastic. Um, Mark, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, from speaking to colleagues of, with, of mine in the West Midlands, um, it's not entirely clear how you define accessibility. Um, and until that is. Until that is that is clear to us, at least. And it is made apparent to us. We're not sure how we would indicate it within NAPTAN. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe this forum can answer that question. If it's patently obvious where this is all written down, how you define a, an accessible stop, then we'll look to it. So any advice? <laughs> uh, I yeah, think... it's in the scheme it's in the schema documentation. Um and is it just a tick box? Yes, it's accessible or no, it's accessible. No, it's not. It's not. Um, it very much depends on what version of NAPTAN that you're using as to the functionality. If you're down at 2.1, there's pretty much nothing. That's but... that's where we've been talking from, that base, I think. Right, OK. Yeah. Give me a minute or two and I'll find it. I'll dig out. OK, that would be great. Oh, yeah. So, so um. That sounds really good. And in fact, I think I'm going to run an entire session on what is an accessible stop 
and really get people's understanding and conventions that people are using so yeah. that we've all got that clear understanding. And That'd that's definitely helpful. something to do in the future. And I'm hoping Lucy's made a check, a note of that one. Mark Jones. Hey, yeah. It was just going back to the point about what a stop actually represents in the physical world. So is it um, from an accessibility point of view, should we have um, a list of what is actually at the stop. So if it's a virtual stop, there's nothing there, all the way through to a full stop, which has got the shelter, the pole, um, information around the uh, timetable, multi-language support. Um, but on top of that is accessibility as well, which is what is the accessibility attributes of that stop. Mm -hmm. That sounds that sounds really good. I've just made a note back on that one. I'll swing back over here. And in fact, I'm just going to copy and paste that. Um, if everyone else has, has put stuff in, I'm going to just take a moment. Uh, just check. How would you? OK, I'm going to just quickly read through these things and then put your hand up if you've got any comments. So if I could, I would. LM NSC, opportunity to appraise network in a new way, particularly in rural. LM NSC, greater visibility of full accessibility from end to end for all parties. Use the data to allow route planning for wheelchair users. How is it? <clears throat> how is accessible defined? So how how do you indicate a NAPTAN? And we've got the answer that it's in schema documentation of NAPTAN, and we will hold a whole separate one of these just about accessibility, excluding inaccessible stops from journey planning results. A uh, list of what is actually at the stop, shelter, pole, etc would provide, can't get out of any system, and we're in the omnibus system. Um, we've got nothing yet on how would you, but we can come back to that later. Um, and what would change for you? We really, we already hold some information about the footpath layout within our systems, but this is not written in layman's terms. Be a big undertaking to update all stops as we have thousands of physical stops. So this is about, just trying to understand, this is about, there's a beautifully accessible bus stop but there's just, uh, there's no footpaths leading to it, means that it's an inaccessible bus stop. Is that what we're talking about here? Just to double check, and then Mark Jones, I'll go to you, unless this is your sticky, in which case, please speak up. No, it's not. <laughs> um, so just making sure if anyone wants to put their hand up. Uh, Beth, did I, is this your sticky? Did I understand it correctly? It is my sticky, you're right. Um, so after last week's session, I, I didn't know we held this information within our system, so I went and looked for it. And, and we do have things like what sort of drop curb and things are around it. Um, but myself and another colleague were looking at it and going, what does this mean? And then how would we put it into layman's terms to be able to put it out? out there for, for a customer to understand or for even for myself to understand but we have thousands of bus stops within West Yorkshire so it, it would be a massive undertaking for us to do anything like that at the minute yeah unfortunately. Um, and then the next sticky about collaborating with local authorities because we're not a local authority as in a council we work with five um, different district councils they look after footpaths and things and areas around bus stops we look after the bus stop so we'd have to collaborate with them to do anything to be perfectly honest cool that that makes a lot of sense um and this is why i think it's worthwhile because accessibility is such a big thing it's really worthwhile kind of having a small group to talk about it both as a people who are putting in information and people who are taking out information. Um, I'm going to read the next two stickies and then I'll go to Tim and then to Mark. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, so LM in NSC, highlight concerns to end user if stop has accessibility concern and list of stops that users have complained about as, as inaccessible. So I like the last one. I think that's a really, really interesting way of almost crowdsourcing some of the problem. Um, so Tim, very quickly to you, and then to Matt Jones. Yeah, just to pick up on um, comments about working with local authorities. Um, so there's another project going on um, within the Department of Transport data team, the same team that's running this NAPTAN one, 
which is all about um, access nodes, um, which um, actually might solve that. So that's all about um, highways data and um, road junctions and things like that. So um, if 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 as I understand it, that project delivers what it's supposed to, then there'll effectively be a NAPTAN for type system for roads data. Um, and so hopefully the two can marry up and it will make things a lot easier. But that's got a way to go yet, that project. Yep, yep. And that's really good to know. And this is some of what we're trying, this is some of what as a consultancy we've come in to help DFT start to see some of the joins that they can make between things and some of the ways that they aligning things will help make things a little bit smoother and, and a little bit easier. Uh, Mark Jones. Hi. Uh, yeah, just on how we would use the data ourselves. So we have software in the bus operators themselves uh, taking calls from passengers. So having access to information around the stops, what's available, um, not just what time the bus is due, but what services are available at that stop would be would be useful to them, I think. So yeah, I, I appreciate there's a big task to obtain that information, but once it has been collated, then it would be very useful for the operators. Excellent for operators. One of the things that came up in the last call was the idea of doing, and I hate to use the word machine learning, um, but doing some kind of using the dash cams from buses to survey the bus stops because how it's it's a data set that's going out and seeing all the bus stops all the time so it's it's it might be another way of of, of looking at it now that's i won't say pie in the sky because i don't think we've even started to bake the pie um but that that was an interesting idea that that cropped up that um i definitely want us to consider in some way tim you had a thought uh, it's not so pie in the sky. 20 years ago, um, a consultancy called IBI did it in um, southern Scotland using um, cameras in, in vehicles to do surveys. Um, and there is also a um, project um, that is um, trialling it in, I think, somewhere in the West Midlands area springs to mind for um, road con asset condition surveys for local authorities. So capturing data about um, where there's railings and where there's lamp posts and things like that. Um, so it's not a million miles of a jump between capturing where there's a railing and where there's a bus stop. So again, a bit more joined up thinking and awareness of what else is going on nationally might help. Absolutely. And thank you, Tim. This has been gold for some of the conversations that I, I'm starting to have around, even if it's coming out of the same place, having having that sense of, of all the different ways that data is coming in um, and how we're using it. Does anyone else have any thoughts on accessibility before we move along? I've seen one that says survey everything, which I heartily agree in some ways. Right, so let me move on to the next thing. Um, do, 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 present, because it'll make, oh, of course it's PowerPoint, and PowerPoint doesn't remember where I was at. Accessibility agenda. Okay, downloading files. So this is trying to understand how you want to download files. So I know at the moment you can get them. You can get them as an XML file for a single authority or for everything. A CSV set of CSV files for a single single authority or for everything. Do you want an API? Do you, do we understand what an API is? Do we, do you always want everything, or do you just want a group of areas? Um, do you want just the West Midlands, or do you want all of the places? Um, what fits you best? And I really want to understand 
what your world looks like. I mean, is XML the big thing? Because um, we know that BODS works at, at an API that does JSON. So should Naptan provide you an API that does JSON? Or should it be an API that does XML? Or do you not care whether it's um, XML or CSV or API? You just want the data in a readable format. So back on back on our um, back on our mural, I've got a little thing here about downloading files. I've got a picture of what I can see here and uh, Please give me your thoughts on whether XML, CSV, and JSON on the left, API on the right, and about everything. Do you just want selections? Do you want just updates to an area? What do you need? And just bear with me here two seconds. I'm just going to check out what that phone call was about. So I'm just going to go on mute for two. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, and let's see where we're going. Mark and Mark and Ian, who are not able to get in and put up anything, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to um, to share? Mark, Taylor. I, I'd just like to retain the ability to download in CSV. Uh, I don't like handling uh, XML, so don't go, don't get rid of CSV. Um, some selectivity in terms of um, area would be useful to retain. Mm -hmm. um, update sounds an interesting idea, but I can't, I'm not sure. But don't get rid of CSV. Why do you, can, can I ask a question, a follow-up question? Why do you like CSV? Because I can it... open it up in a spreadsheet and that's how I, and my, my immediate colleagues work. I don't like dealing with, I don't like having to open up XML in things i just don't like it it's so much easier csv um, that's probably it, my ignorance but there you go it's not ignorance and and i i was just trying to also understand um is it it's about the readability definitely yeah i mean try reading an xml file is horrible oh i have and it's it's the worst yeah so it's just so much more convenient for my app for my use you know the particular things that i i i use the data for so i want a few stops in derbyshire or derby city or something like that and selecting derbyshire or derby city and then finding out what i need to find out it's just very easy for me um not fancy but useful yeah so here's a just throwing something out there to ponder on and then i'll come to i'll come to roger um if we had a nice web interface that you could say show me the dots show me the data for derby city stops and it just brought up here's all the data for derby city in a nice pretty diagram with a map and all of that would that be more useful or less useful than a csv in your life right now that would be additional too okay. I, might, well, I'm, I probably want to go and do some stuff on my on my desktop with the with the csv okay take That's it away and do something yeah And do something. Okay, Roger, your thoughts. Uh, really just um, supporting what Mark was saying. Um, CSV is an incredibly useful format. Um, if you are forced to work with a system that doesn't have a good XML handler, XML is a nightmare to actually write one for. Mm -hmm. um, CSV is trivial by comparison. Um, so we have a number of homebrewed systems. Um, we, we do not have a good XML handler um, for those systems. It would make life much easier if we did. 
but um, we're forced to rely on CSV, um, it's so much easier to do. And gotcha. as Mark says, you can open it up, you can read it. Readable is good. Um, so here's a quick question. Does anyone actually like XML? Uh, Ian, <laughs> Ian, Ian, I'll come to you. Well, just raising that question and please feel free to put down a sticky or something to say whether or not you like XML. So Ian and then Lee. Oh, sorry, Lee's put their hand down. Ian. Yeah, first. to me, XML is not an issue uh, because of the import tool that we use. It takes the XMLs and brings them in. That isn't a problem. And from the software we use, which is Omnibus, you can generate your Excel files, etc., if you want them anyway. So that would cover off the CSVs that uh, the other guys are on about. One thing that I was interested in, if DFT has got some funding and like the idea of doing some fancy um, graphics and maps on there, uh, were what developments are they going to do with the uh, Nuptig then? So, because the Nuptig will be useful to make sure that you've got the stops with the right localities in, uh, and something which is uh, a GUI base would be brilliant. Because they used to do that years ago before they got disinterested in transport. But yeah, you know, that's a bit of a catty comment. I appreciate. It. There you go. I, I'm all for catty comments. Trust me. Um, Nuptig, could you explain what Nuptig is? I've written it down, but I don't think I've I've understood what it what it means. National Passenger Transport Gazetteer. So each ah. stop is within a locality. In PTG. Yeah. yeah, it's the other bit. I didn't know yeah. it was called Nuptig. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> it is it's not catchy, sounds, but he does it. Sounds sounds a little bit like um, Numpty, but that's just. I couldn't possibly just, comment on that. Really. Well, I could not oh, possibly comment yeah. either, especially okay. as we're being recorded. Um, so I've just had the bing bong go off. So what I'm going to do is I will just run through the sticky notes and then if people put their hands up, if they've got any thoughts or questions and we'll go through. So on the XML, CSV or JSON. Just let me zoom in so I can read the smaller ones. Uh, CSV, XML, nationally are essential when looking at processing national data. Please do not retire old fold types like CSV. They may not be fashionable. They're still in use. We have nothing that uses JSON currently, but wouldn't object if it was added. Download in CSV can open a spreadsheet it's about readability using for a small number of stops and you can take it away and do anything. CSV is eerie, easy, queryable, downloadable. No need full XML as now, so no need to change process. Deltas might help more often. Um, CSV is useful when XML is a pain. Homebrew systems and readable is good. Import tool, XML is happy. And MPTG or NUPTIG, um, GUI based. Um, kind of interface. Uh, our LMNSC XML is powerful and has huge benefits in data provision with an element of future proofing. Uh, JSON would be useful as would more functional XML readers that simplify and allow simple editing. So that's everyone's thoughts on XML, CSV and JSON. Let me just come across to API. Um, API could be useful in future for a find my nearest stop. Um, that's good to know. And everything selections updates. Um, ideally, we would like options for everything or selections. However, it is important. Existing formats continue to be supported. So we're essentially, we're going to keep the formats. We're not going to change the formats. We just want to understand if there's other formats or other ways or how you're using those formats so we can make things better. Um, currently, the system supports selection by area and gives you everything for the area. This seems robust. Add updates if, if, if there's sufficient demand, but don't retire the ability to download the whole picture. Everything with a last updated field. So this person wants to see everything, but with uh, a field that basically says this was last updated. Now, is that because you want to find the most recent information and therefore being able to get the most recent information since date X for everything would would fulfill that need? Or is this part of how you're using the data? I'm just trying to tease this one out a tiny little bit from this one if, if people want to comment. Dan. 
Yeah, uh, so that was me. So we uh, we downloaded all the data and we have you know last updated date in our SQL database, so we can do checks when that data was last updated and make sure it's all been updated regularly and things like that. Also, it's good to know if we ever get a query uh, on a stop or some information that stopped being wrong, we can say well, actually that stop was last updated by this so and so user two weeks ago or something like that. So we'd expect that change to have come across. Um, mm -hmm. So it'd be good to know when updates are made to each record. Um, as part of the data but again i'd want the whole national data set uh, to be loaded yeah. all at once but actually just to have that kind of i guess metadata against when it was updated um and you want the whole data set because of the way that you're building your software or is that i'm just trying to understand so so we take the whole naptan data and then we embed it into other data sets we embed it into trans exchange into the stops element sale we embed it into uh, sif data still for some clients we embed it into gtfs um, and things like that so we just want to take a whole national data set and have a database um, that's just got naptan in it that we can then query as and when required because mm. one of the things that i'm thinking about with an api or considering is that an API does that, give me the last updates for everyone um, that's happened since since here, and it just automatically folds into your system. So that's some of what I'm trying to understand yeah, why but... people would still need to download it. But I think that's something that we're going to get to when we get to the data quality, because I think that's processing that you're doing that that we need to know about. That Naptan's not a particularly big file, is the other thing I'd say. So actually downloading a whole Naptan CSV file and loading it into SQL database takes five, ten minutes in total. It's literally isn't a big process. We've got processes in place. So we don't really need to just do an API call to call the latest update. We just purge the database table and then reload the data automatically. Okay. That 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 makes lots of sense. Well, that does make some sense, but I'm going to have to ask my technical person who's not able to be here because he's in one of the other three meetings that the team had to cover today um, to help me out understanding that. So I'll share the recording with him and then we'll probably come and have a chat with you about this. Um, Tim Rivett. Yeah, so um, one of the attributes on a stop point um, is modification date and time. Um, so if you're using XML, um, in theory, it should be there, but I suspect that the um, DFT Naptan database isn't handling those um, attribute elements um, of the of incoming XML. Um, so it's there, um, but I suspect it's just not being implemented. This is one of the things that we're looking at because we're looking at rebuilding some of the ways that we handle the data that comes in and how it's how it's presented out. So we want to understand the best ways of doing that. So getting on to that, is there any other thoughts on downloading files, the formats, what you need from it before we go on to what you do with that data? Cool, so the next thing I want to go through is about data validation, data correction. Now, I'm very aware that you do stuff with the data that you download. So we've got a good uh, 40 minutes to talk about this. So what I'd like you to do is put your hands up and tell me the sort of things you have to do with the NAPTAN data to make it work for you. What are the cleanups that you do? What is the checks that you do? What are the things that you do to make it better? How do you check it? What data do you need to validate before you can use it? How do you check it? Why do you check it? How much work is this for you? Is, how usable is NAPTAN data? And one of the other parts of this is um, if we're trying to make data quality better, there's a difference between uploading slightly wrong data often and uploading good quality data once. And I want to kind of get your thoughts on that as well. Is it about uploading stuff oftener means that you think uploading stuff more often, use actual English, uploading stuff more often means that you're assuming that that's a sign of quality or do you have another way of thinking about quality? So for this, um, I'm going to run and you get to see me try and type in real time. This is this could go ever so wrong. 
Um, so I want to understand what validations you do before using the data. Um, and I know there's quite a lot of people who do different software things. So how good is Naptan? Is it solid gold quality, amazing data? Or is it a little bit, mm, needs a little bit of work? It's a little bit jazz. It's a little bit not jazz. It's a little bit grunge. So stick your hand up and let me know what you think of the data. Mike Baxter. Hi there. Well, I I am um, I'm mainly involved with um, sort of running the real time system in Leicester and Leicestershire, and we just use the Naptan data to populate the system, and um, we get the date the the uh, the schedule data from the bus operators. But in terms of Naptan data, often you, you only find out about, say, stops that are missing out of Naptan by by local knowledge. So you'll you'll say map out the route and you'll see you'll see that the bus goes down a particular road and a, a stop is missing and it's missing because it's not on Naptan, but it may have been put in by the parish council. And then the parish council doesn't inform the the um, may not have it known to inform the, the the county council. So there's a lot of trial and error and, and local knowledge. Um, I, I'm not sure there's, a, there's there's quite a bit of processes behind the scenes that perhaps aren't there that need to be there to ensure the the quality of the data in, in the central repository, if you like. Mm -hmm. so. uh, Peter Stoner, your thoughts? Well, I, I firstly say that the data is so much better than it that it used to be. The, the, we must give credit to those who work on it that it is much better. Um, but but the, the, the one of the, the main things that that we would look at um, is first of all is just to to really get out of the system any stops which have uh, suddenly misplaced by a very great degree, perhaps through a incorrect coordinate being put in or whatever, because they will make um, in journey planning can make very fast um, journeys from one part of the country to another, possibly. And the journey, journey planners would love those because, of course, they uh, they focus uh, journeys around something that is so fast and apparently efficient. So we're very keen to um, spot those as soon as possible. Um, and I think related to that, probably um, also any stops which have suddenly landed in the sea, um, mainly because um, b b because uh, people think it's a joke, you know, and uh, uh, respond very badly to the credibility of the whole system if they see mm -hmm. a bus stop out in the North Sea or whatever. So we, we look look for those most of all. But but uh, there's another one that really that's a link to to what Mike Mike said, of course, is that is that if the operators haven't taken the updates frequently and are using old NAPTAN data, then we are faced with um, new NAPTAN data from the source and schedules that have, have a base assumptions and, and data because they haven't used the latest data set. And so that's actually one of the underlying problems that we have. Right. Uh... So uh, da, 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 da. I'm just trying to summarize this. Um, uh, uh, faced with new Neptune source as older used for um, route planning. Um, so one of the questions here is, would it be useful to know the version of um, the data that somebody has built something on? Well, that's not the basis on which of it is that, that, that everybody should update to the latest one as, as, as soon as possible. So. <laughs> yeah. ASAP. Excellent. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on the validations before using and what you, and what you need to do around using the NAPTAN data for, for before you can actually really start to use it? Can I just ask, are we meant to be able to see your screen at the moment? Oh, has it stopped sharing the screen? Well, I can't see it, but it could be my lack of knowledge on how to use Teams, but 
because I'm not an expert. Could could somebody just confirm that you're still able to see my screen at the moment? If not, yeah, I will yeah. stop and reshare. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I, I, I can it's, too. It's, it's me then. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm not good okay. enough on Teams yet. It's possibly okay. hidden somewhere, hidden the window of my screen. Um, are there any other thoughts on the validations before using NAPTAN? Um, the validations that you do, apart from local knowledge, is there any checks that you run um, that you use to confirm that the data is looking good data? Like, how do you know something's in the middle of the North Sea? And I know that sounds really obvious in some ways, but it's not obvious if if you're the sort of person who has to have this available so that they know where people are and don't make dumb mistakes like they did last time of not knowing that West Midlands is is nowhere near Yorkshire. Um, so how do you know when something's in the middle of the North Sea? Ian and then Roger. Okay, just a couple of things on this one. In terms of the download, for the purposes that we use it, we use it for creating data to send to travel line and for journey planning down the, the road that way. So we consume data for a, a joining uh, local authorities. And in all honesty, you have to make the assumption that they know where their stops are. It's only when an existing route or track that you've built suddenly goes into the middle of a field because the stop's there, do you then have to get in touch? And then what you're looking at, you, you've got to create a network of contacts in order to say, look, you need to have a look at this because I appreciate that it's our world had that tool. Not everybody used to go on and check that tool. So you're looking at who you contact to say, you need to have a look at this because there's something gone wrong. A bit like in the North Sea, if you've suddenly put a Mr. Digit out, yes, it suddenly disappears, but then that breaks so many other chains down the down the line. I'll give you for an example, if somebody, for example, Manchester, if they delete a stop that we submit a service to, to travel line that uses that stop, it will then fail validation somewhere along the travel line process. And then that service won't be shown in any journey plans further down the line. And that is something we have no control of whatsoever. And we won't, might not even be aware that that stuff's been deleted. So in terms of downloading users, that's where we would get involved in it and contact local, local mm -hmm. uh, um, adjoining authorities. That makes lots of sense. So uh, not able to see where went wrong until much later. So it's got a very long feedback loop. It could do, yes. Yeah. Right, just bear with me here a second. Um, uh, Ian, uh, that was Ian, so Roger. Hi, um, yeah, I agree with everything that Ian has just said. Um, essentially, if you want to keep your data in good order, you need to have um, good practices behind it. You need to be um, updating frequently. Um, I know that um, some operators where we are, are up, that they'll tell us, oh, we update every three or four months. Well, there's too much churn in the system to be able to rely on the data not having changed in that period. Um, we update weekly, for instance, um, to synchronize with the, the travel line build cycle. Um, the tools that we use, we rely very heavily on travel lines uh, metrics, which will uh, will tell us if a route is using, as, as Ian says, a stop that is um, no longer in NAPTAN. Um, we rely very heavily on ITO's metrics. I don't quite know what we're going to do when those go away. Um, those are structured in such a way that if there is a gross error in the position of a stop, you won't just see one error popping up. You'll probably see hundreds. Mm-hmm. Um, because what you will have is um, one error for the stop, um, if we're taking the North Sea example, one mm -hmm. error for the stop being in water, one error for the stop not being within 50 metres of a road. Um, you will have one error for the stop's locality being unusually long and thin. Um, and then you will have several hundred errors where it's ploughed straight across uh, numerous other localities and overlapped them. Um, which is the thing that is the real trigger. As long as you are using these metrics, as long as you're checking them every week or more frequently, um, then keeping the data in good order 
um, isn't difficult. Now, that's as a data provider, but we're also a data consumer um, because we have a lot of cross-boundary services. Um, so, for instance, we use London's data quite a bit. Um, so the same feedback there um, applies um, as would for any other data consumer. Um, we're using Traveline, we're using ITO to get some idea of where the Neptan is not in great condition. Um, it's much, much better than it used to be across the board these days. But um, I remember 10 years ago when I started, um, large swathes of London, everything pointed due north, for instance, in Neptan, um, which obviously wasn't the case on the ground. Um, so that's, that all seems to have been fixed in the intervening years. But, um, but it, it is a case of using the metrics you have available. When ITO disappears, you know, we desperately need something to replace it. Um, mm -hmm. to do these checks, um, otherwise will we lose a great deal of our diagnostic ability. Um, and you're using feedback from any consuming system. Excellent. Um, I'm going to pull a little corner off to talk about ITO World in a moment and talk about what's good, what's bad and what you'd like in a replacement. But we'll just park that for two minutes and we'll just keep on um, trucking through this if that's okay with everyone but I will sp spare a good 10-15 minutes to talk about e Ito World, Ito World. Um, Mark Taylor and then Mike Baxter. Mark Taylor. Hello. Hello. Sorry I had my uh, microphone turned off. Um, Back, every, back up everything that Ian and um, Roger have said. Um, in Staffordshire, we've for a number of years told adjoining authorities, who at the time uh, were the only people generating schedules, i.e. for travel line, where we've deleted or moved stops significantly. So they get a heads up about this. So they're warned about mm -hmm. a change. Uh, don't know if anybody else does it, but um, so, so we so, can we give them advance warning of that we're about to delete stops. That also applies to adjoining authorities in other travel line regions. I I I think I'm also going to, as on top of Eta World, ask questions about travel line. But I just want to quickly finish covering this off. So uh, Mike Baxter, and then we'll move on to the kind of Eta World travel line questions. Oh hi there. Um, I just wanted to say that yeah, I, 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 I'd be interested to find out about ETO well disappearing as well because I, I didn't know that, but um, and I'd miss that as well. Um, I, I was just going to say that uh, I think there is certainly in the system I use there there is perhaps an element of stop data being changed locally, which I know is a big no no, but it, I think it it does happen because there are certain things that we want to tweak that potentially is not tweakable within Naptan or not very easy. And I suspect bus companies probably do a similar thing in their scheduling systems and probably lots of people doing their various systems. So I think uh, there perhaps needs to be an easier way of making sure that trying to prevent people like me or whoever doing local changes without updating the the source data because mm -hmm. obviously that's that's you know it, as soon as you because there's a tendency not to want to upload the latest naptan willy-nilly in case you kind of destroy some local information that will get overwritten with new stuff and you've forgotten that you've you've got some other valuable stuff that will you will then lose so that's that's what, all i wanted to point out. it's kind of a, a custom and practice thing but Mm -hmm. um, I know it goes on, and um, there might be good reasons for it, but it's it's, it's still it's still there. <laughs> so so just to help me understand, when you say making these tweaks, what sort of tweaks are you? Little changes that that aren't going through Naptan. Is it all the stops out of commission for six weeks, or is it? Um, no, it's more a case of um, there might be um, the name of the stop might be I don't know Charles Streets. We might put it as Charles Street C A. Um, so we, when we when we look at it on our um, real time system, we can see which one it is. Whereas in Naptan, I think the C A bit 
may not be included or it's included on one of the I, I'm I, I apologize I'm not an expert on that term on one of the other fields which our system either doesn't use directly or um, is um, sort of hidden away and so we kind of bodge the the um, common name to, to be something else so we need to remember we've done that and then redo it after we've uploaded NAPTAN because it'll probably just come in as Charles Street if you do an upload, a, 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 a new NAPTAN download into mm. our system. So um, it, it's 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 probably it's probably not a fault with NAPTAN, it's probably a fault on our system, but I suspect there's all sorts of little things like that that other people perhaps do on their systems to make it work. But um, it, it's just, the, I'm just trying to defend sometimes where people have said, oh, the bus companies upload it only once a once every couple of months, but then that's wrong. But there may be reasons for doing that, which in themselves are wrong. But the, um, there's there may be some culture things to sort out as well as technical ones. That's what I'm trying Absolutely. to say. Absolutely, I gotcha, and yeah. and that was what I was trying to understand. Yeah. What some of this questions is trying to understand is what are the tweaks you're doing. And why and why are you doing those tweaks so we can understand, OK, if we how can we make that feedback loop better? And also, how can we make those tweaks not have to happen? In the meantime, we need to talk about the elephant in the room, the 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 closure of of Ito World for this purpose. Um, and I'm just going to put it down and I'm going to use I think I'll use gray like I did last time I'd like I'm going to open the floor tell me your thoughts tell me what you think about Eto World um I know that somebody from Eto World is here so um we'll try not to be personal um and and it's not about the, there is contractual stuff that is making this have to happen as far as I understand from the DFT side there is contracts and procurement stuff that's force the situation um, and what we're trying to do is figure out what we how we help you get past this little contractual moment so uh, Mark Taylor you're up first tell me about Ito World and your thoughts on it well we regret its demise and we agree that something's got to be put in its place um, the West Midlands region um, the members are filling in a questionnaire about what we like or dislike about Ito World, and that's got to be supplied by Friday this week. So I'll be filling out what I think about Ito World and supplying that to the region, and so will the others. So okay. just to let you know that that information will be available. Excellent. And do you know? Well, I don't know where we're going to send it yet, but I was going to say who's running that survey, and it'd be really good to know. Well, this came out of last week. I reported okay. back and said that you know. We, we really need to write down what we think about, about our tone, and what we'd like, uh, like mm. it to be replaced with, if not if not just retaining it, oh, world. So um, that's what kicked that off, and uh, so we're doing that. Oh, excellent. Well... I didn't know it was going to be discussed this week as well. I I also had no idea, but I, I'm more than happy to pivot and discuss it as well. But, and well, I think... Once, once it's been compiled by Gary League at West Midlands, then we'll make it available to whoever's interested. Uh, at West Midlands. Um, I think that I, I know that I would be very interested. Um, I think Adrian would also be very interested because we need to look at how we build that tool, how we get the funding, how we make sure that we don't leave you without a, a useful tool that does and it the needs same national thing. feedback, not just the West yeah. Midlands. Everybody oh, here it needs to be brought in from all over the place because it's a national tool. It's a national yeah. problem, it, it disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll shut up. No, no, please don't shut up. You've you you come with really good ideas. Uh, Roger Core and then Ian Barrett. I'm oh, sorry, I, I left my hand up from the last oh. question. My bad. <laughs> Legacy hand. Um, Ian Barrett. Okay, just a quick few ones on this. If uh, there is going to be an alternative tool, they've got to make it usable. But everybody's loading out. If the world have developed their tool over a number of years, that's fine. Not a problem with that. The problem that seems to be with the way that DFT thinking is at the moment, it's a bit like what's going on uh, with the 
the open data, et cetera. Okay, they'll create something in a spreadsheet which has got a huge macro in it. And you, as a local authority, the way that our IT systems are so tightly bound up, you cannot use that. Or even the message that came through about there's going to be a Napton tool, you've got to run a Python script. There is no way on God's earth our IT are going to let us download or play with anything like that. So it's got, if they're going to produce something different, it's got to be usable, that is accessible from local authorities' mm. uh, perspective, because otherwise it's pointless. Mm -hmm. That's, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I'm probably on the same technical level as, as most people with the local authority, possibly even less. And um, I tried to follow the instructions and I actually had to go and ask my team, my tech lead, how to do some of these things. And even then I've, I've given up because I just couldn't, I just couldn't make it, I couldn't do the things because I don't understand the things well enough to do them. So we do need to do a better tool. Um, Andrew. Your thoughts on Hello. Eto World? Hello again. Um, yeah, I've been using Eto World for for X amount of years. Uh, I think the functionality is fabulous. Um, I think it's given us a lot of help uh, because uh, we know um, we know if our bus stops are in the sea, or if they're not in the sea. Um, I think it's it's been a great tool. And, and as you've said, um, we're not we're going to be without it because of of contractual issues. So. I guess if we're going to procure, or if you all are procuring another version of it, we, it's, it's got to be as good as, if not better, than what we've got at the moment. Um, and yeah, because uh, yeah, it's I like how it links to Google and, and OpenStreetView mapping, um, so you can see on other sources where your bus stops are. I think that's I think that's brilliant. Um, but yeah, whoever replaces it needs to have the same functionality. Uh, and make it as easy to use so that so that we can um, update our stops. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. That's really good feedback. Mike Baxter. Sorry, I just wanted to um, ask, what are the timescales on, on the demise of Eto World? Is that is that public knowledge or, or not, please? Um, to my knowledge, and bear in mind that this is to my knowledge, um, and hopefully, Lucy, if if I say something wrong, you can step in and say it right. I believe Eto World's contract runs out in December. We haven't, uh, to my knowledge, don't have a replacement, and we are looking at how we can do something that that provides the same functionality. In your context, there's no possibility of extending the contract for six months or. And, um, and that. I know that's being investigated. We do run into a procurement problem in that it was extended already. So it is now beyond the point where it can be extended through the government procurement. So we're just trying to understand if there's a possibility to continue to do that, to gain us a bit more grace period or what or what the options are. Right. And I know that there's a massive long email floating around about all of this, and that's my summary of that massive long email. Right, OK. So I, I can remember the previous tool that was was in place before um, ETO World, and um, that vaguely remember it, and that was nowhere near as good. Um, <laughs> Um, obviously, but so we, we don't want to go backwards, I suppose. is Yeah, the, yeah. I totally am with you. We should never go backwards. Um, Peter Stoner. Well, just uh, I mean, you, you got that that right, Dr. J, but um, I, 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 I'm just having to leave for another meeting. So I didn't want you to, to think I was taking it personally that I have to go, but that, that, <laughs> I couldn't find the chat button either. So that, that's me saying goodbye. So, okay. okay, thank you very much, Peter. And appreciate that I got the bits that I needed to get right for this. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on 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 Eto World? So one of the things that came up last time um, between Eto World and Passenger was the number of kind of false alerts or alerts that said something was wrong, but 
we kind of agreed that that it's not really wrong wrong it's just kind of mildly wrong and we're not going to fix it or it's not really wrong it's just your opinion that's wrong and my opinion is this um and i wanted to get some sense of how you all see that and if you had the discussion last time, this is a chance to have a second run at it. If you didn't have the discussion last time, this is a chance to have a run at what does good look like? What is an alert? What does what what should show and how should you be able to handle it? If something is flagged as an error, but you're like, yeah, I know because that's actually a new road or we've moved it, but there's a there's a something there. I just kind of want to understand your thoughts on those because I think that was a bit that came out of last time around what's an alert and I'm going to focus on this for about five minutes or so and then we'll move on to the next bit so Mark all I was going to say is that there are many tests in ITO and I think to be fair to people, they'd need to go and consider each of the each of the tests and, and consider their value and, and any tests that were missing, perhaps. So it's a difficult question to ask here to get a comprehensive answer. That's what mm -hmm. I'm suggesting. I, I couldn't do it off the top of my head. That's why I'm going to be looking at this questionnaire and putting in the things that I'd like and dislike, but I'm going to have to think about it. So so one of the things that we should perhaps start doing is talking with the people who were using Eto World and really understanding what it did and what it didn't do yeah, and what it did yeah. but they don't want so we yeah. can build the right tests. Definitely. And it's principally because it's the local authorities who are maintaining the data, you need to be asking them. Mm. We're going to have the duty to maintain it. So. so I'm just going to put a note here, build the right tests. Yeah, but you need to consider it. Yeah. Uh, I'll shut up. No, please don't. You're giving very good feedback. Roger, let's, let me just have a look. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger so I can read it. Ito's ability to suppress errors is really useful. Suppressed errors do have to be reviewed, though, otherwise the system is abusable. The manual error function serves that purpose well, though. So, that, so just to make sure that I understand it, you could say, I got an error, but I kind of know about it and I'll suppress it. And you could just leave it suppressed until it's fixed or it's kind things it's going to take a long time to fix or you just don't care it's, it's whether it's or not more for a possibility. sorry it's more for those cases where um yes technically that is going to look like an error to the system um bearing errors are fairly common here mm -hmm. um because the road is doing something a bit funny at that point maybe the bus is using a lay-by that's an odd shape so uh, the bearing of the bus when it actually pulls up which is what you're supposed to be recording in NetTan, doesn't match the bearing of the road at its closest point to the stop. Um, so you suppress that because, yes, technically it's an error, but that is what the bus is actually doing. Um, so you, you get these with cases where the name is really strange. For instance, Basvik in Brighton um, is, um, is, is, is the, the poster child for that. It's all capitals, B-H-A-S-V-I-C. The to record it, it, it it's, it's 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 short for something which wouldn't fit in under the 56 character limit so you couldn't use that anyway and basvik is how everybody in brighton actually refers to that location so it would be a nonsense to call it anything else so yeah technically that's an error it's all caps um right but that is what it's actually called so that is what you're supposed to use the uh, the suppression mechanic for um, if something is an error that needs fixing, you don't suppress it. Um, you might take some time to get around to fixing it, perhaps, but you don't suppress it in the interim. Uh, right. and the manual error function allows anybody to review anybody else's data and say, hold on, this doesn't look right. Um, so if you have large numbers of errors that you've just suppressed and swept under the carpet, somebody is going to find that. Mm-hmm. Um that's really good. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, data doesn't look right. And also those examples. Um, so here's a quick question for you. And 
this is maybe my lack of understanding of the world still. Um, why does bearing matter for a bus? Is this a, a um, I, I understand that like on one side of the road, you know that it's going this way and on the other side of the road, you know it's going that way and you need to know if I'm traveling north-ish, I want to get across the river, I need to know that I'm heading kind of vaguely north-ish. Um, away from the river, I live in South London, by the way, um, I'm heading south-ish, but why does bearing about a bus stop matter so much? If somebody could give me a two second explanation. I think it comes down to the decision to represent everything at the individual stop level. Uh, that's not the only way that you could structure something like Nat 10. You could um, say that paired bus stops were represented by a single notional point, for instance, um, and just ignore the whole bearing um, issue entirely. But when Nat 10 was devised, they decided they wanted to be able to record everything right down to the stop level. Now, since it's based on Transmodel, I would assume that that decision was taken a long way away from the DFT. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of stuck with that. But if you are going to record at the point level and you have a stop that's on a corner, for instance. Um, now, if you imagine the, the way that mapping systems often work is that they will try to um, snap a stop to its closest road center line. Mm -hmm. If you have a stop that's very close to a corner, um, the main road is perhaps four lanes wide. Um, because it's an A road. Mm -hmm. So the road center line there is uh, at least two lanes away from you. So, you know, it could be could be 20 odd meters away. Mm -hmm. uh, but the side road is um, a single track. So mm -hmm. the um, the road center line there is uh, maybe four meters away from you. Mm -hmm. um, you would if it's a stop that is actually serving the A road, you would want its bearing to correspond to that of the A road. So it's another one of those instances where the fact that it would throw an error, essentially, in, in saying that, no, I don't match the bearing of my closest road, just alerts you to the fact that something might be wrong with that stop and the way the system views it. OK, I think I've got it. Um, this may be something that I ask questions of later. I think it's a technicality that I don't need to get into. Uh, David. So the whole point of having the bearings are mainly for RTI predictions and progressions so that you can load the bus stops into a ticket machine and the bus will know on that journey which stop it's approaching because the bearing will match the direction of the bus. And then you can give predictions on how far the bus has got along the journey when it's arrived at the stop and things like that. And Roger's right that there are lots of cases where we have to adjust the bearing slightly to represent what is really happening because the data only has it on the eight points of the compass and you don't want to um, allow too much variation either side. At the moment, the ticket to tracking is plus or minus 40. Um, so it takes in most things, but bearings is one of the biggest problems we have with um, getting scheduled adherence and uh, predictions right. Cool, I'm gonna ask, and it went one of uh, very important and getting schedule right. Um, I'm going to ask what RTI means. Real time information. Oh, of course. One of those ones of you've just spent way too many minutes typing about something else. RTI, real time information. So this is like the, the voiceovers and that on the bus that says we're approaching the stop um, and it kind of gives that that bing bong sound or is this for reporting back so that you and the control booth know where the buses are both really okay. depending on what system you're using but it, it it's there to do um yes i've got to this stop so the next stop is i can announce it i can show it on a display and i can also show 
back in the control room that I've served that stop and at what time I served it and whether I picked up people there. Cool. Totally gotcha. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to move on to the, the last thing, um, which is, so we've done quite a lot on data woes. One thing we could fix is, so I want you to sit down. You've got one post-it. Um, you write on it one thing, only one, um, that we could fix. And then when everyone's written down their one thing, we'll group them together and we'll choose across everybody one thing that is really, really important to this group that, that, that we could try and fix. And I'm guessing it'll probably be replace Eto World, but that's I, I'm not going to be overly predictive. Um, let me just zoom out. So if you can just put on here on a sticky one thing that you could fix and Mike Baxter, I'll just come to you for your comment. So I've just uh, uh, other people have probably noticed it, but I just I just noticed having just logged into Eto World, which perhaps I hadn't for a while. There is actually a notice on there saying about the fact that it's going to be withdrawn at the end of the year of the uh, Etel World tool. Yeah, it's a it's a very discreet line across the top, isn't it? Yeah, and if you click on that, then you get a, a link where it sort of gives you a bit more blurb, but basically says it will cease at the end of the year. So uh, yeah, so we, we it, it, do, it does sound a bit concerning, shall we say, <laughs> to me. Anyway. Yeah, I can I can totally understand your feelings on that. To add to that, I think one of the overriding things that comes out of that is there's a lack of communication between who, uh, the FT NAT, uh, and this NATSAN group or the NATSAN uh, uploaders and creators. Because to be honest, I didn't pick up on that at all until uh, Pete Stoner sent uh, a message through a, a different source totally. Now, I'm registered on that service. I'm registered as an account holder with NATSAN and uploading and downloading. So why can't they get a reasonable uh, communication database set up and say anything to do with NAPTAN? You email all the people who are already registered rather than piecemeal. Be my complaint about it. I think Jay just stepped away, but I think that's um, a really interesting point. Um, I think she's back now if you wanted to just say it again to her. To um, them. Sorry. Them. Yeah, no problems, Chloe. No problems at all. Sorry, I, I, the joys of being in lockdown means that I can get veggie boxes. The joys of being locked down means they usually come in the middle of a meeting. So, um, sorry, I got part of it. Um, Roger, if you'd like to give me, or whoever it was, just give me the second part. I know that you didn't get the message directly until Peter Stone sent something out via something else, and I just wanted to make sure I understood the rest of the problem there. Okay, it's Ian, LCT again. Basically, have an account with Isil World, have an account with DFT in order to upload and download NAPTAM. So you would have thought it's not uh, too difficult to, when you're communicating major changes to do with NAPTAM, why don't you have a unified communication data set, say, these, these people here are interested because they have their accounts. We will email them with the latest details rather than the people finding out second hand. A bit like, was it Mike Baxter just found out in the meeting today? You know, that's not good to say the least, but there you go. I totally agree. Unified contact list list around changes. I'm going to add that into the just one thing uh, and I'll put that off to Put, put, put that off to the side because I think it's a really good idea to have a contact list for the various things. One of the things that we've struggled with that um, I asked for, and I think we're still only thinking we're about 90, 80 something percent right, um, is a list of all the local authorities and the people who are uploading for local authorities because that's actually difficult to get um, for all kinds of various reasons. So I'm just going to give you another minute or so, and then we'll just turn the timer on for a minute um, to put any kind, any more one things up there.
Ah, here's a quick question that I think I would like to go into. Uh, and then, Mark, I'll come to you. Oh. Travel line. I really want to understand why it's got a long feedback loop for you. And I get a sense that's a little bit more than the 10 minute conversation. So that might be another session. If you're up for having more of these sessions, it'd be really good to get your feedback on travel line and how that data flows, because obviously it's part of the feedback loop that's coming back into NAPTAN data. Um, so Mark, just to get your thoughts. Uh, well, it was on the contact list for NAPTAN um, so it's the previous item. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that the our county council, um, you won't get through to the a single person. We we'll, we'll give you a contact number, probably the central contact number, and they will then contact a person who's doing NAPTAN at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, we certainly don't want to be flooded with requests oh. from here, there, and everywhere about the quality of our NAPTAN data. Yeah, it's the same with roads questions, things like that. So um, I think they'd be cautious about giving out names. Yeah. But a central contact number, fair enough, so that would be that would be legit. Yeah, um, we were so sorry, we... Mark. It, sorry, not to tell, sorry, Mark. It was, uh, it was more to do with major issue, major initiatives. Definitely, such... definitely, yes. Ian. Definitely. I accept for that a, a as long as it doesn't get before. misused. <laughs> yeah, no, you mean. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, definitely having a having a like a P tick contact list or a, you know, that sort of thing. Definitely agree. But I wouldn't want that being misused. I don't want to get direct phone calls from the public about issues on bus stops that can go through the contact centre. And it might not be me who deals with it anyway. <laughs> um, I noticed there was a sticky that had lots of words on that then went missing. Did. Does anyone remember what the sticky said? Or was that something I, I remember it being about Ito World? But that, that was my a... fault. I'm sorry. I tried to put a sticky on and something went wrong technically. So um, it wasn't my sticky. So whoever, whoever I destroyed their words, I do apologize. Um, I am clearly technically incompetent this morning. <laughs> That's OK. I'm barely managing to type into <laughs> and, and, and into boxes, which is being I not only it, seen live but, but recorded something, something to the effect of it, it the tool needs to be at least as good as what we've got already but i can't quite remember but i'm sure whoever wrote it will remember i'll shut up <laughs> i'm just writing a new tool needs to be as good as ito world because i think that's that's a really important point um we need to do more with accessibility i totally agree with that um ensure no data lost in central system. Um, one of the things that I am aware is that you can, we've not been storing all of the data. There's been, if, if you uploaded more data than the 2.1 schema, we were just basically going, mm -hmm. um, uh, now that's a historical thing, but that's something that I, I think that we should look into to make it slightly better and we've started to look into ways of doing that with our proof of concept with the alpha as to how we can ingest more than just the current data so that allows people to think about a migration plan towards 2.4 2.5 and need I say the n-word netx word um, into into those different schemas not that we've got a NetX for the UK yet. That's a whole separate beast that we will have to get to. Uh, is there anything else under one thing that we want to go through? Does anyone have any thoughts on these one things? And is there anything burning that they think you should just fix this? Just fix this and it's going to be better. My world will improve mm, some. Oh, come on, we can't be that perfect that you can't think of something that we could fix.
So what we've got here is effectively the main things to fix is the 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 Eto world and that feedback from travel line. So improving the feedback loop from travel line, improving the feedback, the the feedback loop that Eto world gave us. Those are the two. Those are kind of the two big things. And for me, it falls into one thing, which is getting much shorter feedback loops in the system of here is here is your data, here are your errors, so that you can fix fix your data much faster, much easier. Mike, your thoughts? So, sorry, I, I was just going to uh, um, reiterate what Ian had said in terms of the communications, because obviously, uh, yeah, I didn't know about the ETO world. Also, I'm not, uh, so I sort of use this on sort of slightly on the fringes of things. I'm not too sure as I understand wh where the the tool that's provided by passenger fits in, because that that sort of is useful up to a point, but not as useful as as the ETO world one. And presumably that is is that just a view only tool? I, I, excuse my ignorance, but I'm sure other people will know. It's not it's not as as fully functional or as detailed as the ETO world one, and I, perhaps someone else can can. Uh, um, illuminate me with what how that fits into things is it is it just something that's provided by a private company just and you use it if you want to use it but it doesn't have any any sort of um legal bearing on things good questions mike does anyone as anyone uh, mark taylor all I was going to say is that when when I used it, it was presented to us. I think it was it was uh, backed up by the DFT, um, who who were very worried about our data quality based on what, at least in part, passenger had been saying about our data. And we were presented with lists of um, s street names and that which they claimed to be false, which were um, when you actually did the test. Um, they were they were they were they were false. What they were measuring it against wasn't wasn't accurate. So it was coming up with false positives, and um, me and a lot of my colleagues just thought it was a bit of a waste of time. I don't know why they got involved. Maybe they thought there was some money to be made out of it. It was a bit of a waste of time. That was my opinion, and we weren't obliged to do it. But it caused a lot of a lot of hassle. It seemed in the DFT thinking all our data was cobblers, and it wasn't. I don't know if anybody else has got any views on passenger. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> we had exactly the same experience. Um, we ended Thanks, up. Thanks, Roger. Given a huge, <laughs> great list of uh, potential problems, and it was it was universally false positives. Yeah, just to back up those guys in LCC, we had the same thing going on. Yeah. That's kind of the sense that I had, but I thank you for expressing it so clearly because that helps me feel that's exactly where it should be. Tim. Um, so passengers developed that tool because the work that they were doing with bus operators, they needed something to uh, to check out a few um, uh, stop locations and things and it. And it was a composite of some internal um, quality a data management tools that they'd got that they put out there um, that they thought might be useful for people. Um, and um, they're very good at um, PR and promotion and it caught the eyes of, uh, of a number of different people, including the DFT, and it sort of spiraled a bit out of control, um, even by their own um, admission. So, um, yeah, it's it's just out there, um, and it was never properly promoted by the DFT. They just um, saw some a tool that said uh, it was uh, it. You know, the, there's some people with some problems with uh, Naptown, which everybody will say, yes, our data isn't perfect, but uh, we all know the the challenges that brought. Yeah, one of the narratives that I think. I have heard was that at least 4% of NAPTAN data is badly wrong um, and there's a lot more that is just wrong and that's been part of the focus on data quality, um, which I feel 
might mis misrepresent some of the work that you do, but also some of the local knowledge things like the Brakovic and the, the bearings on stops and things like that. Um, and that's really good to know that wrong doesn't mean wrong doesn't mean wrong, if that makes sense. There's layers of wrongness. Um, right. We've got like a minute left. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for everything that you've done, for all of your wonderful input. Um, I just really want to appreciate, say thank you very much for your time. So uh, we're going to send out the slides recording, the mural board, um, anything else that you'd like me to send out. With the last one we sent it, we sent out the link to um, the validator site that had gone missing from the NAPTAN app. Um, and also, if I've said that I'd love to contact you, um, I will do my best in the next couple of days to get your email address and say hi and set up a, a kind of one to two, one to three meeting. Uh, it's be me and you and possibly Chloe and Lucy to sit down and talk through some of these questions and to really get a sense of what's going on. And if you've got any questions or afterthoughts or you think, actually, I should have said this or looking at this now, I've thought about this, um, drop me a line. That's my email address at DFT. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all again for your time and for your participation. It's been wonderful and really great. Um, thank you, Dr. J. Thank you.